From our investigation, we strongly feel this individual has been involved in other homicides. We have taken evidence out of the building to be examined. Why Jeffrey Dahmer's inmate killed him. The dust had settled in one of the most gut-wrenching cases in America. That was the moment the infamous Milwaukee cannibal Jeffrey Dahmer was sentenced to 15 consecutive life sentences, February of 1992. He was locked up in the Columbia Correctional Institute. The victims and their families could at least take some form of respite, knowing that he'd suffer for long or so they thought. Just over two years into his sentence, on the morning of the 28th of November, 1998, Dahmer and two other inmates walked into the toilet block for cleaning duties. Dahmer and one of the other inmates never walked out. What had just happened here? And who was the third inmate who walked out undetected by the guards? Backstory. To have been convicted of 15 counts of first-degree murder and receive a sentence of over 900 years in prison can only imagine the things Jeffrey Dahmer must have done. If there's one thing we can be sure of sometimes when the law is involved, it's that the consequence is usually commensurate with the crime, and you'll find that in Jeffrey's case as well. Dahmer committed his first murder when he was 18. He had been driving when 19-year-old Stephen Hicks, who was heading to a rock concert at Chippewa Lake Park, Ohio, decided to hitchhike with him. As they drove, Jeffrey brought up the idea of Stephen going with him to his house to have a few drinks. After drinking, Stephen told Jeffrey that he wanted to leave, but Jeffrey didn't want him to. It turned out that Jeffrey was hoping he would act on his feelings for Stephen. Seeing as he couldn't stop Stephen from leaving, Jeffrey used a 10-pound dumbbell to strike Stephen twice on the back of the head. As soon as Stephen passed out, Jeffrey used the bar of the dumbbell to strangle him. The next day, Jeffrey dismembered Stephen's corpse and buried the parts of his body in his backyard. But because he didn't want to leave the evidence behind, he dug up Stephen's body weeks after, peeled the flesh off the bones, and dissolved it in acid. He then flushed the output down the toilet before crushing the bones with a sledgehammer and spreading them around his backyard like mulch. After Jeffrey killed Stephen, he went on to kill his next four victims. 25-year-old Stephen Tuomi, 14-year-old James Doxtator, 22-year-old Richard Guerrero, and 24-year-old Anthony Sears. This was between 1987 and 1988. In the years of 1989 and 1991, Jeffrey met and murdered his remaining 12 victims, and his last victim was 25-year-old Joseph Brederhoft. Jeffrey's MO for all of his victims were in this order. Order, strangulation, dismemberment, and decapitation. But as they say, everything comes to an end. In Jeffrey's case, he just wasn't expecting it. His arrest and trial. To get rid of the dead bodies in his apartment, Jeffrey bought a large tank, filled it with acid, and threw the torsos of his victims into it. He also cooked the dismembered body parts and constantly ate them, hence the alias Milwaukee Cannibal. A few years into Jeffrey's crime spree, a man named Tracy Edwards came dangerously close to becoming one of his many victims, save for the fact that he followed his instincts. Tracy and Jeffrey met in July of 1990. And as usual, Jeffrey convinced Tracy to follow him to his apartment. Tracy said that when he got there, he sensed that something was off. He was fortunate enough to get out of the apartment and run for dear life. While running down the street, he stopped a police car and told the police officer how he felt something wasn't right about Jeffrey. This incident marked the beginning of the end for the 31-year-old killer. The police officer Tracy spoke to called for backup, and together with other cops who responded to his call, he raided Jeffrey's apartment. To their sheer horror, the authorities found several pictures of dismembered body parts all over the apartment, about four or five decapitated heads in Jeffrey's freezer and dismembered body parts in both pots and pans. They also found in the large tank the torsos Jeffrey had dissolved using acid. Jeffrey was immediately arrested and taken into police custody. His day of reckoning had come, but things would only get worse for him from then on. After six weeks of being in police custody, Dharma finally confessed to his crimes via pages of writing. During his trial, he pled guilty by reason of insanity, but he was deemed legally sane at his trial. At the end of his largely publicized trial on February 7th, 17th, 1992, Jeffrey Dahmer was convicted of 15 murders and was sentenced to 15 terms of life imprisonment. The presiding judge ruled that Jeffrey would live out his days in the Columbia Correctional Institution, Portage, Wisconsin. Life behind bars. The nature of Jeffrey's crimes placed him in people's bad books. As a result, he was placed in protective custody and held in isolation. In the same vein, he was never let out of his cell except when he was bound. After a year of being held in the isolation cell, Jeffrey appealed to prison officials to move him to a different unit, stating that he had been cooperative operative and never caused any trouble. His appeal was heard, and he was moved to a unit for inmates with emotional and mental challenges. In this unit, Jeffrey was able to relate with other inmates. He started attending classes and even signed up for work duties. Along the line, Dahmer met a prison minister, Roy Ratcliffe, whom he reportedly often shared remorseful remarks about the murders he had committed with. Around this time, Jeffrey also started going to chapel. In May of 1994, Jeffrey sought to be baptized, and he was baptized by Ratcliffe in a water tub in prison. After his baptism, he began to share with other inmates 
roommates the correspondences he'd been getting concerning his newfound faith. According to several reports, it was during this time that Jeffrey began to display certain behaviors that other inmates didn't appreciate. He often made jokes about cannibalism, saying that he was going to bite them. Dharma also had a knack for molding his food to look like dismembered body parts. As if that wasn't bad enough, he would proceed to cover the food with ketchup to complete the look. While some reports say he ate the food afterwards, others say Jeffrey left these rather disturbing pieces of food art lying around for the other inmates to find. Whatever the case, the inmates didn't like this sick game Dharma was playing. But there was a particular inmate who took his dislike to the extreme, and this inmate was none other than Christopher Scarver. Christopher Scarver. Scarver was born in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, just like Jeffrey. After he dropped out of high school and got kicked out of the house by his mother, he joined a youth conservation court program, where he secured a position as a trainee carpenter. During the program, a supervisor reportedly told Scarver that he was sure to become a full-time employee as soon as he completed the program. However, that did not happen. So, on June 1st, 1990, an angry Scarver made his way to the office of the training program, declaring that the program owed him money. One of the people he happened to meet that day was his former boss, Stephen Lohman. When he asked Stephen for his money, Scarver said that Stephen gave him $15. This reportedly provoked Scarver to the point that he shot Stephen in the head. After Scarver fired the first shot at Stephen, he went out of control and ended up shooting the wounded man three more times. Still armed with a murder weapon, Scarver demanded that the manager write him a check for $3,000. He then proceeded to steal the manager's credit card before heading to his pregnant girlfriend's apartment. The police found Scarver outside his girlfriend's apartment hours later, and since the murder weapon was still in his possession, the authorities had him arrested. By the time of Scarver's sentencing, his girlfriend had already given birth. Scarver was sentenced to life in prison for his crimes in 1992, the same as Jeffrey. But according to Scarver, despite the few similarities that they shared, he stayed away from Jeffrey while in prison. Aside from the fact that Scarver didn't like Jeffrey due to the gruesomeness of his crimes, he also didn't like how he was usually causing trouble. While speaking on the issue, Scarver pointed out that many of the other inmates shared his sentiment, and he even recalled how a fellow inmate, Osvaldo Dorothy, had attempted to cut Jeffrey's throat with a razor he hid inside a toothbrush. Despite his obvious dislike for the serial killer, Scarver pretty much didn't mind Jeffrey, and did his best to stay away from him, up until 1994. What changed, you ask? You're about to find out. On November 28, 1994, Scarver, Jeffrey, and another inmate, Jesse Anderson, had been assigned to clean the bathrooms in the prison's gym. Scarver said that while they were cleaning, someone poked him at the back, and when he turned to look, he found both Jeffrey and Jesse laughing under their breath. Although this greatly angered Scarver, he didn't do anything and decided to wait until Jeffrey went to the locker room. Moments later, Scarver removed a metal bar from a piece of exercise equipment in the prison weight room and followed Jeffrey into the locker room. In the locker room, Scarver bludgeoned 34-year-old Jeffrey Dahmer to the brink of death. He then went after Jesse and did the same to him. Jeffrey died as he was being rushed to the hospital, while Jesse died two days later. When Scarver was asked why he did what he did, he claimed that he was the chosen one and that he had to do it. Scarver also claimed that the correctional officers knew that he didn't like Jeffrey and that they intentionally had them work together so that he could kill Dharma. Of course, there is no proof to back up these outrageous claims. Regardless of whether or not the correctional officers intentionally set the pair up, the deed was done and Jeffrey Dharma had died after serving three years of what was supposed to be a life sentence. Following the brutal murders, Scarver was catapulted into the spotlight as he received a lot of commendations and backlash from the general public. While some people said he was still a criminal, a greater number of applauded him for getting rid of Jeffrey Dahmer, whom they had always thought deserved to die. Some accounts even state that Scarver received thank you notes from the families of some of Jeffrey's victims, the aftermath. While the court of public opinion did its thing, the truth remained that Scarver had committed cold-blooded murder and needed to be punished for his crimes. The case was brought before a court of law, and in addition to the life sentence Scarver was already serving, he was given two more life sentences. Scarver is still alive today. He's currently in a medium security prison in Wisconsin, where he self-publishes poetry. He has been spending his free time writing songs, music compositions, short stories, poetry, and prison policy proposals, as well as creating original art, according to his Amazon bio. Currently, Scarver has multiple poetry books for sale, including 2015's The Child Left Behind, and has managed to remain in contact with his son through it all. The two have reportedly maintained a good relationship all these years. In addition to being a published writer, Scarver also wishes to attend college to study mechanical and electrical engineering through his American Prisoner Repatriation Act initiative. Needless to say, Scarver is dedicated to making the most out of life, despite being confined to a prison cell. And that brings us to the end of the video. To check out other videos like this one, kindly click on one of the other two on your screen. See you there. The Son and the Holy Ghost. Amen.